Vietnam has more to offer to tourists than just the remnants of war. Historical monuments and palaces testify to thousands of years of history and culture, and the country's unspoilt natural treasures captivate its visitors. First came the Chinese, a thousand years the French, followed by the Japanese who were in turn soon replaced by the Americans. Today they all come at the same time, but on a peaceful mission as tourists. Throughout its 4,000 year history, Vietnam has suffered war and foreign rule like no other country in the world. The Vietnamese people have an unyielding desire for their country to emerge into the 21st century at the forefront. Moving further away from the tourist centers, however, there is less and less evidence of this attitude. While rural areas are still characterized by peasants wading through paddy fields, mobile carrying business people are a common sight in the cities, where remnants of the colonial backdrop are eclipsed by tower blocks or are even being torn down to be replaced by even more skyscrapers. Vietnam form is determined by natural borders. The South China Sea to the east and vast highlands to the northwest and west offer protection from the neighboring countries. Vietnam's two lowland regions, the Red River Delta in the north and the Mekong Delta in the south, are limited to a smaller area and make up the two rice bowls of Vietnam. Due to the positioning of these fertile lowlands and the shape of the country, Vietnam is sometimes referred to as the bamboo pole with two bowls of rice. The name is derived from the way in which loads are carried with the help of a bar and one basket on each side in Vietnam and China. Vietnam's population of 90 million makes it one of the most populous countries in Southeast Asia. Between 1960 and 1993, the population doubled in size, though it is unequally distributed. The contrast between the densely populated lowland regions and the all but deserted highlands is striking. From 1963, North Vietnam has attempted to curtail population growth through family planning education. The directive aims to limit the average family size to two children, to increase the marital age of women, and to determine that the first child should not be born before a woman reaches the age of 22. In addition, the recommended age difference between the two children should be at least five years. Befitting the high birth rate, Vietnam's population is overwhelmingly young. Two-thirds of Vietnamese are younger than 35, hence they were born after the war. This is also a reason for the rapid change in society which can be observed in Vietnam today, and the pragmatic stance towards the United States, once Vietnam's arch enemy. It is the young who are primarily responsible for heavy migration to urban centers such as Saigon, Hanoi, NHA, Trang, etc. A million people, most of them young, leave the countryside for the cities every year, many illegally. They dream of a higher standard of living. Average income per annum is estimated at around 1,300 US dollars. Poverty has been reduced by more than half in the past two decades, but the urban-rural divide is still sharply pronounced. As a country situated both politically and culturally in an area of conflict between Southern and Eastern Asia, virtually all world religions have left their mark on Vietnam. Unlike its neighboring countries Laos and Cambodia, where Buddhism is omnipresent, a far greater spiritual diversity prevails in Vietnam. The country itself brought about the worshipping of ancestors and animism. Several influences came from the outside, such as Buddhism, both from China in the form of Mahayana and from India in the form of Hinayana. Hinduism was the religion of the Cham in central Vietnam, whose descendants are still followers of Islam. European missionaries eventually brought Catholicism to the country. There are also several mostly regionally operating sects which in the recent past had greater significance, also in the political arena. Unlike in Europe, philosophy is an important part of daily life. First and foremost, Confucianism and Taoism. Year-round humidity combined with high temperatures creates very fast-growing lush vegetation in the tropical rainforest. There is no distinct time of blossoming, ripening, or defoliation. Everything appears to happen in parallel. Due to the tropical climate, organic material decomposes rapidly and it is possible for a tree to regenerate itself with its own foliage. In the flood hazard zones of the river, deltas and seacoasts, there are lots of bog and mangrove forests. The movement of the tides means they are flooded twice a day, when only the upper trunks and treetops remain above water. The trees have high stilt roots, as well as respiratory roots that loom out of the water at low tide. Vietnam is a veritable paradise for zoologists. 
In no other country have as many animal species been rediscovered in recent times. For example, the gray-shanked Duke Langur in 1997, and a colony of white-cheeked gibbons in 2011. Approximately 280 species of mammal can be found in Vietnam, a lot of them endangered, such as the Asian elephant. 180 reptile species, 80 different amphibian species, and 2,600 fish species have also been recorded. Researchers have also listed between 773 and 850 types of bird, 11 of which are indigenous, and approximately 6,000 different insect species further enrich the Vietnamese fauna. Some 100 wild elephants can be found in various provinces such as Lai Chau, Da Lat, Con Tum, Dak Lak, and Tay Ninh. Cat Tien National Park is one of Vietnam's most important habitats for elephants. With the Javan rhinoceros already hunted to extinction in Vietnam by 2010, elephants are in similarly serious danger on account of their tusks. According to the WWF, the price paid for ivory in Vietnam is higher than anywhere else in the world. US dollar 750 per pound. Almost all of the ivory is sold illegally to China, were it not for the millions of Chinese and their absurd superstitions concerning the healing powers of animal ingredients, the threat to so many valuable wild animals around the world would be vastly diminished. In 2011, in Bin Duong province, such greed even led to the slaughter of a domesticated elephant for its tusks. The ivory trade has been outlawed in Vietnam since 1992, but with one loophole. Ivory which predates the ban can still be sold, and the WWF states that it is virtually impossible to ascertain the age and origin of the merchandise. Elephants have been domesticated in Vietnam for centuries, particularly by hill tribes who use them for heavy labor. They are bred in the central highlands close to Buon Mathuot in the village of Ban Don. The village hosts a folk festival in spring that lasts several days and features costumes, dances, and elephant races. Food represents an entire life philosophy in Vietnam, and rice in particular, cultivated here for centuries. The Vietnamese have three wholesome meals a day at precisely the same hour. An ethnologist even concluded when observing food rituals, the Vietnamese are concerned about a filled rice bowl not only in their present life, but also for their next one. This also explains the many food donations during ancestral worship at home. The meaning of food is deeply rooted in Vietnamese history, which for millennia was marked by wars, droughts, floods, plagues, and other catastrophes. Necessity is the mother of invention. And this is the reason that all kinds of animals still end up in the cooking pot. Just as the country is split into three main regions, the North, the Central Region, and the South, there are also three culinary traditions. The Northern style is strongly influenced by Chinese cuisine. Stir fries, stews, rice pudding, and soups are especially popular in this region, where the climate is cooler and drier. The lack of herbs and spices here also make meals less aromatic. In the Central Region around Hue, the former imperial capital, cooking was a refined art and came to play a significant part in a refined way of life. Special attention was paid to decoration and presentation of food, said to please the royal palate. The cooks from Hue are known for their pork sausage, their sweet and sour rice cake, and their soup ingredients with a mix of fried tomato puree, chili, and prawn sauce. Around Hue, many European types of vegetables are used as well. Artichokes, cauliflower, asparagus, and potatoes. Southern cuisine is less complex, but spicier than up north. Exotic fruit and top quality vegetables grow well on this fertile land and are served uncooked with meals. In this region, quick stir fries and sautés are preferred to fried or slowly stewed dishes. Spicy curries are very common. The French influence of the colonial rulers is most evident in the use of asparagus, tomatoes, and potatoes, which are prepared Vietnamese style. Grilled dishes are equally popular here. In the South, it is customary to wrap fried or grilled meals with raw vegetables and herbs into a salad leaf. This little package is then dipped into a hot sauce. Now that you have a better understanding of Vietnam's background, it's time to travel around this amazing places. Personally, I suggest three places you must visit in Vietnam for family or couples. If you are looking for some activities for adult, you may probably need to find other resources. I can't explore here, or if you guys really want to know, I can make another video especially for that. In the 1930s and 1940s, underground chambers and trenches served as hiding places and weaponry stores for guerrillas fighting the French. Over time, they were connected by corridors and further extended in the fight against the Americans. 
This concealed network ultimately extended from the Cambodian-Vietnamese border, following the Ho Chi Minh Trail all the way to Saigon's Chinese quarter of Cholon. In 1966, unaware of the subterranean enemy, American troops of the 25th Infantry Division set up their headquarters close to the tunnels. At first, they were unable to explain where these nightly attacks on the heavily fortified military camp were coming from until they discovered the tunnels. Some 50,000 U.S. soldiers combed the terrain in search of the well-camouflaged entrances. The partisans lived on three levels up to 10 meters under the ground. Narrow shafts broadened out into a subterranean labyrinth of sleeping quarters and muster stations, sick bays, kitchens, prayer rooms with shrines, workshops, stores, and bomb shelters. Babies were even born in the tunnels, only seeing the light of day some years later. Tiny trap doors, overgrown with grass and foliage, led up into the outside world. They were all protected by primitive, yet effective, traps. Some tunnels are thought to have ended in rivers, thus improving the chances of escape in the event of pursuit or bombardment. Ventilation was ensured through inconspicuous bamboo canes, where pepper and chili were grown to throw tracker dogs off the scent. In time, the dogs were no longer able to distinguish between Vietnamese and Americans as the Viet Cong had begun using American soap, aftershave and clothing they had taken from their prisoners. Attempts to flush the enemies out of the tunnels were thwarted by a variety of tricks. Trapdoors over pits, for example, in which bamboo cane had been filed into spikes, sometimes tipped in poison, booby traps as they were called. Dummy tunnels and entrances were deployed to lure intruders into explosive traps, with bombs and mines laid beneath the turf. The former imperial city of Hue nestles between the foothills of the Annamite mountain range and the sea. As early as the 18th century, poets paid romantic tribute to its gardens, lakes and canals, and its charming location on the Perfume River. Today, the complex of Hue Monuments is on the UNESCO World Cultural Heritage List. The city retains a certain courtly flair and a hint of the Francophile lifestyle. Essentially, the town can be divided into three parts, each with its own distinctive character. The citadel complex with the imperial enclosure on the north bank of the Perfume River really is a must-see. To the east of the Dongba Canal lies Fu Cat, an erstwhile trading post, now an overcrowded district packed with shops, pagodas, and Chinese Union halls. On the south bank of the Perfume River, the European town has developed, the modern administrative center of Hue and Home to many of the town's hotels and restaurants, graced with beautiful streets and villas. The landscape to the south of the town is marked by pine forest hills interspersed with tombs and pagodas. This is where the Nguyen emperors built their mausoleums. The Perfume River winds its way through the scenery, its name a legacy of the blossoms and tree gum it carries with it. An excursion with a dragon boat through the romantic river valley is an unforgettable experience. The famous Tian Mu Pagoda and Thuan and Beach are just a bicycle ride or boat trip away. Until 1306, Hue belonged to the Cham Dynasty, before the land north of Da Nang was handed over to the Vietnamese as a condition of a peace treaty. However, it was Emperor Jia Long, founder of the Nguyen Dynasty, who bestowed such significance on Hue as the capital of his empire. His reign not only witnessed the construction of the citadel, but also of dikes, bridges and canals, as well as the Mandarin Road, which connects Hue to Saigon and Hanoi. Hue would subsequently become an important center for Buddhism, the arts and scholarship. In 1885, the French conquered Hue. The colonial rulers allowed the Nguyen to continue as masters by name, but without the corresponding influence. So it was that Hue was stripped of its status as capital city and fell into a slumber of almost sleeping beauty proportions, which lasted for almost 20 years. When the Geneva Conference of 1954 split Vietnam in two, Hue was allocated to the south. Thousands died on both sides in the Vietnam War, and the citadel was almost completely reduced to rubble and ash. Meanwhile, the gargantuan task of rebuilding Hue has spanned a period of over 20 years. Thanks to UNESCO, which designated the imperial enclosure and royal tombs as World Heritage Sites in 1993, these initiatives have gained immense support, proving not only beneficial to the historical buildings, but also helping to revive the traditional craftsmanship required. Every visitor falls under Saigon's spell. The South Vietnamese metropolis on the river of the same name impresses with colonial buildings in soft shades of ochre and shady boulevards lined with tamarind trees, Chinese temples, and a host of sites made famous through literature and film. Saigon's appeal lies in the mix of districts, each having retained its own distinctive character. The former French town center, the real Saigon, and Cholon, 
the old Chinese quarter are outstanding. Jia Din was the third and most Vietnamese of the three districts that grew together to make up the city of Saigon. Even though the communists gave the city and the neighboring rural lands the name Ho Chi Minh from 1975 onwards, none of its inhabitants stopped calling the old heart of town on the harbor by the name by which it had been known for centuries, Saigon. Some of the highlight attraction include History Museum, Bin Market, and Jade Emperor Pagoda, etc. In recent years, the cityscape has been evolving more and more, with mirror glass hotels and office blocks shooting up. The old Saigon of crumbling facades, colonial villas graced with arcades and graying prefabricated concrete blocks weathered by monsoons, street traders with fruit carts and countless food stalls is being supplanted by an upwardly mobile with a modern veneer as can already be found in the neighboring countries and so-called tiger states of Asia. Alas, the rapid transformation into an Asian skyscraper city makes no exceptions for splendid old villas, open markets, parks, and alleyways. Legendary restaurants and cafes frequented by Graham Greene have felt the wrath of the wrecking ball or given way to multinational corporations and chic shops. Millions upon millions of mopeds honk and rattle relentlessly through the traffic chaos like miniature battleships. The days of rickshaws and three-wheeled cyclos are numbered. The leisurely vehicles are largely banned from the center or are reduced to ferrying tourists in convoys along designated sightseeing routes. The people of Ho Chi Minh City are generally considered to have an easygoing lifestyle, in contrast to the inhabitants of the political center of Hanoi, who are perceived as more reliable and broader in their vision. Not far from the new scenes, however, old traditions persevere in some residential districts beyond the commercial center. Vietnamese daily life unfolds as ever, primarily on the street where old men hunch over board games, shoe shiners wave at passers-by, and a woman carrying tasty snacks in her shoulder baskets cleans old rice bowls on the curb. Anyways, due to the limitations of the video, I can only provide you with a brief overview of Vietnam. However, I can assure you that it is a truly remarkable country that you should definitely consider visiting at least once in your lifetime. If you have any questions regarding traveling in this amazing country, or if you would like to learn more about specific locations within Vietnam or other countries, please don't hesitate to leave a comment below. I will try to make a video for you guys with my team. If you found this video interesting and helpful, please remember to like and subscribe to our channel. Your support motivates us to continue creating content for this channel. See you next time. Bye-bye.